This is the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast, brought to you by Kronos Investment Partners. We interview industry experts to unlock key information that will help young professionals break into the multifamily world in order to create long-term and short-term wealth. If you enjoy the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and written review so we can reach more listeners. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast. I'm your host, John Stober, with my co-host, Fritz Ritter, and today our guest is Rama Gupta. Rama is a nationwide insurance broker at Kapnick Insurance Group. He specializes in providing coverage for multifamily and rental properties across the country. On today's episode, Rama breaks down how insurance costs are calculated, the types of coverages and deductibles every property owner should have, and why cheaper is not always better. Rama Gupta. Thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast. You are a multifamily insurance broker, so could you just give our listeners a little bit more background into what exactly you do? So, for the rest of the world out there that's not in the industry or knows what a, uh, an insurance broker is, basically we are someone we would partner with um, an investor to procure or satisfy whatever insurance requirements or needs they have. So um, if that's what a broker does, but what we try and do on top of that is also share best practices in risk management and mitigation. So I'm aware of two different types of insurance policies. You have cash value and then you have replacement costs. And if there's any more, please let all of us know. Um, we're not insurance experts. Could you just go into the differences between those two types of policies? Yeah, absolutely. So as a firm, we 99% of the time, we will only present replacement costs, uh, valuations. Uh, and that's just because it, well, the difference between the two, so replacement costs, that's what the insured, so that's what the, they, and it's new for old. So, or old, so if say your building burns down, um, and we're gonna have to edit this. I'm stumbling all over. <laughs> yeah, just, so, just start over. Um, okay, yeah, I'll start all over. this out. Perfect. Okay, so with replacement cost versus actual cash value valuation or forms, the uh, we as a firm only present replacement costs, and that's just because that's if your building burns down, the, this is what they'll pay to have it rebuilt. Um, Actual cash value, while it looks simple on paper, how they actually pay out is not straightforward. And oftentimes it leaves clients in the hole. Um, you know, it, it's easy if the whole building burns down and they're just going to give you a check for that amount. But what happens when it's only 25% of it and how they calculate what they're paying out for that claim, you're not going to get it's uh, insured for a million dollars of actual cash value and 25% of the building is, needs renovations. Um, they're not going to just cut you a check for 250 grand. Uh, how they calculate it typically will leave the um, the operator in the hole on that. So are there any circumstances where an investor may desire actual cash value? I mean, what are the benefits of it? The real benefit is it's cheaper. So if they're, so if they're looking at a deal and they need the numbers to be at a certain spot and the lender doesn't have any requirements dictating what type of coverage form they have, then they would likely use an actual cash value um, policy. And then so with the replacement costs, like you said, it's like if my building burns down, the policy makes it so that a brand new building can be built over that. You know, it replaces the value. What would happen if my building has appreciated a lot in value during that time though? Does the replacement costs give me additional funds at the end of it, or are they just funding the new construction? So they would, uh, so if it's increased in value, um, the typically you will have a review with your broker each year to make sure the values are correct. So we'll say you've got a property spreadsheet, we'll call it the statement of values. That's what brokers work off of. That's how they market you, present you to the carrier world. And so they use the statement of values and you'll go through that each year and update what the total yearly rents are, building valuation, what you think it would cost to replace. Uh, we typically 
if it's just normal frame construction, nothing, um, nothing elaborate, fancy. Right now, the uh, replacement cost rate is about a hundred twenty-five dollars a square foot. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so moving to the question. Well, so the the question is um. Like if it costs six million dollars to replace my building because it was burned down in a fire or a tornado. We'll edit. <laughs> Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you guys hear me? No. Nah, yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. All right. Anyway, we're just gonna go without the headphones then. Okay. I mean, sounds yeah. just as clear. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Let's uh, let's see if I can stop making this so choppy. Okay. So, John, did they, let's just did let's they... just ask the I'll, I'll ask the question again. We'll edit all that out. So replace So replacement cost is like if my building burns down, the policy is gonna cover the new construction of that building. You know, they're gonna give me enough funds where I can build a brand new property. What happens though, let's say it costs $5 million to build a new property, but my property burned down and it had appreciated so much in value that it's now worth $8 million. Does the coverage give me an extra check after the building has been constructed for the additional $2 million, or are they just paying for the cost of the construction? So they aren't going to pay you for the extra value on top of what they're going to do is they're going to pay for the cost to, to rebuild it. Uh, to reconstruct what basically what you had. So in that instance, so if there was an instance where that's why it's important to use proper valuations. Um, so if you had your asset valued or the con replacement cost valued at $80 a square foot for uh, construction versus $125 a square foot, you're going to be, you're going to be underinsured there, even though it is replacement costs. Um, you yeah, know, they'll build, they will, there would be some sort of penalty or cost share incorporated there, but it, you typically want to make sure valuations are accurate. And so how do you ensure the valuations are accurate? Is that done with your lender or do I just give you my P&L statement along with like, a, you know, a market cap rate? I mean, how am I supposed to make sure I'm properly insured? Um, just make sure that your cost of construction is matched. So if, so frame about $125 a square foot, uh, masonry non-combustible, those are those will have higher cost of constructions per square foot uh, incorporated in the valuation. So as long as, and a lot of times, it, if you've got a um, good broker, the underwriter will double check because they all have their valuation tools that they'll use to um, calculate the cost of the replacement cost as well. So it's pretty foolproof for the most part, but Valuation is uh, so the valuation for replace what it would cost to build new it will be different than what it would uh, the valuation of what you could sell it for. Okay, so then moving on, we got actual cash value versus replacement down. It sounds like we're only going to be doing replacement cost. What are like the most basic coverages that are required in any policy? And I'm thinking like fire as like a, something you have to have no matter where you are. So any lender is going to require general liability and property coverage. Uh, they'll want the property coverage to match. So you could do the, if you were doing ACV, you could do the uh, actual cash value for whatever the amount of the loan amount is. Mm -hmm. So you could buy a, we'll say a 16 unit in Toledo for, you know, half a million dollars, but the cost to re rebuild that is closer to 1.2 to, you know, $2 million. So you could insure it for half a million dollars. So the lenders, the lender requirements are satisfied. Um, anyways, so moving on, they'll, they'll want property and liability. Some will require an umbrella depending on the size of the asset. Um, if it's in a flood zone, they require flood or earthquake coverage. Um, other than that, they typically don't dictate anything else, but coverages you'll want to have are ordinance and law and sewer and water backup. So sewer and water backup, um, that's basically if there's a couple years ago, we'll use Houston as the example. 
uh, they had a lot of rain and their sewer infrastructure was not, uh, it hasn't been, it wasn't equipped to handle the amount of water they had. So there was backups everywhere that resulted in flooding of people's homes, apartments, and everything like that. Well, guess typical property coverage excludes water damage. Or if it's in a flood zone, you should have flood insurance which would cover that. So that's mm -hmm. where sewer and water backup comes in. So it can really happen anywhere. And it's kind of out of your control as an operator. Um, so with ordinance and law, say we've got an asset that was constructed in the 1970s. So ordinance and law would pay for the increased cost of construction associated with bringing that asset up to whatever new building codes were required by whatever municipality um, from how they've changed from the 1970s till now, if there was a claim. And then you'd mentioned also an umbrella policy. Could you just quickly explain what that is too and why that might be necessary? Yeah. So an umbrella policy, that's basically excess liability. So you've got your general liability, which is typically 1 million per occurrence, 2 million aggregate, and the umbrella would be excess over top of that. So if there were over $2 million in liability, the umbrella policy would just cover anything up to the limit of the, you know, whatever the umbrella is for. Correct. So say you've got a, we'll say you've got a $4 million umbrella and one, two general liability. So you basically have $5 million in coverage for any single liability lawsuit. So say somebody slips and falls and they sue you guys, or they sued the operator for, I don't know, like, $3 million, which is an absurd amount. Well, the, uh, if there was a, it's, it's, and we'll just hypothetically say the claimant was awarded a judgment of $3 million. So the general liability would pay out the first 2 million and then the umbrella coverage would pay out the remaining 2 million. So I wanted to know what, when you made me a policy, you brokered it out and I wanted to know what you look for in a policy versus what you think other people may beef it up because you were able to get me substantially less in my package versus some of the other people. So how do you think you were so competitive in that? It was definitely a challenge to get there, but part of what, part of being able to get there was understanding what your goals were, kind of where the numbers used to be and where they needed to be. Um, it was knowing which markets that particular asset could be a good fit for and going to them and telling the story and making sure the underwriter was comfortable with the risk. And I understood that, Hey, this is a great asset. It's updated, good tenants, stable, great operators. And it, just knowing where it would be a good home. I mean, it's uh, it took a little bit because I struck out a few times on it. So is it, is it really one of those things where maybe this is just my perception of things, but I always viewed insurance as kind of automated, you know, you're plugging numbers into an auto, into an underwriting model and, you know, you get the quote that you get depending on like building age and location. Is that not, it doesn't sound like that's actually the case though, where your broker can make a huge difference depending on the relationship he or she has and who they know and then yeah. being able to sell themselves. Absolutely. While that information is still very integral with the underwriting process being so as a broker our job is to represent the client in the best light so convey tell their story to our underwriters so we have to sell it to our underwriters we also have to manage the relationship with our underwriters if we bring them crappy risks all the time we're talking high frequency just just crappy then we're not going to have a good relationship with our underwriter because our loss ratio with them is not going to be good. So they're less likely to do us a favor. But if we have consistently bring them good risks and it's within their appetite and we have a good loss ratio, we've got a better relationship with that underwriter because we're making their job easier. So it's easier for us to ask a favor or get them to apply the max credits without pushing on them. And it's uh, and for you, it's also important to make sure you're working with somebody who understands your risks. So that way they understand your business, understand the important points, the, ri the uh, risk drivers, and they can represent you appropriately. So what are some signs to look for in, an, in a good insurance broker? You want, you could ask for references. You'd want to understand what their experience and background is. Is insurance, think of it as, it's kind of a catch-all. Uh, you've got home and auto, which I, I know the basics of, but I 
I wouldn't call myself an expert and that's something I'd bring somebody else to in. Um, agribusiness. I know the basics, but that's just insurance basics. I would bring somebody else in to actually market that risk or meet with somebody who had a, um, a need in that area. So the same thing applies with multifamily and commercial real estate. Um, you don't go to um, a real estate broker that does, that sells single family homes. You would go to a broker that specializes in commercial real estate, multifamily assets. So just like that, you would go to insurance, an insurance broker that specializes in that type of risk. Um, there's a good chance the multifamily real estate broker, there's a good chance they know which brokers in the area um, can do that. Okay, that, that's a great tip too. get a get a referral from your real estate broker. Yeah, if you're just getting started out, um, the guy at State Farm has taken care of your home and auto for years. He's probably he's, he's not going to be the best fit for evaluating being able to represent you best in the marketplace for a, a multifamily asset just because they don't know all of the risks associated with that or specialty coverages that need to be included. Do you think your real estate investing uh, has helped you in your career for helping your clients understand what they need in a policy? It actually came, that actually came second. And I think what's really helped me is just understanding all the, all the insurance, uh, insurance aside, or just understanding all of the other aspects that go into running, uh, being an operator of multifamily assets, um, I think that's what has helped me the most. And then understanding the most common uh, drivers of claims to, under, to help understand where the risk comes from. So as we buy and sell multifamily properties, there's different parts of the life cycle of a deal. I mean, the beginning, you're probably doing your renovations or if it's new construction, you're building it. And at some point you stabilize it, you're not doing renovations anymore and you're just operating the property and eventually you go to sell the property. Mm -hmm. During those different stages of the, life, of the life cycle of a deal, are you gonna require different insurance policies or different coverages? Let's take new, yeah, let's take new construction out of this. Um, typically, an insurance carrier, if, if there's ongoing renovations, they will ask, but if you're just, let's start with the acquisition part. So you're evaluating a deal to, for an acquisition. So where the insurance broker will be most helpful in that part of it is you're, you're underwriting that deal to a certain number. So the insurance is at a certain number that you need to evaluate it to. And if you can't procure insurance, insurance at that number, that's going to hurt your NOI going into the deal. So, I mean, the insur your broker, your insurance broker, they're typically, they'll, they'll typically be there, not at closing, but, you know, right before closing. So the lender has the certific certificate of insurance showing that everything's good to go. The lender makes sure everything is good to go and on you go. So typically you'd be set for a year. You would, you wouldn't need to do anything else for that asset to satisfy any sort of insurance requirements as long as everything was structured together, structured correctly from the get go. Um, depending on the size. So just general renovations, you typically won't need anything else uh, um, other than I mean, if you're utilizing a third party or a, a um, general contractor, um, there would be some other, depending on the scope of it, there could be some other things like builder's risk and just making sure the contractual agreements are transferring risk away from you. Um, ground up construction, the big thing is um, builder's risk and that's to basically ensure, so it, you know, when you see a new frame apartment going up, you see all well, the frame go up and then you've got all the building materials there. What happens if the, the new one has been um, um, arson? So there's a new project going up, somebody in the neighborhood or community doesn't, didn't agree with the project, they'll light it on fire. So the builder's risk pays for, would pay for a loss like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's different than regular fire coverage? Yeah, well, builder's risk would be the fire coverage for that. Okay. That's just what it's called, basically. That's your property coverage for a new, pro for a new construction. So besides builder's risk, is there any other type of coverage that might 
you know, you might recommend that an operator have while they're doing their value add portion of the deal, especially when dealing with contractors. I think it's important to review the contract. And in fact, you're, you can partner with your insurance broker and there's a good chance they can look at the uh, risk transfer portion of the contract. Um, short answer is no, you, there's nothing else coverage wise you want. You just want to make sure that they all have general liability and that you're listed as an additional insured on those policies and you want to collect certificates on that. Okay. When going into a deal, what exactly do you need to perform your job? So for us to do our best job, the more is if, if we have good information, that is basically the best thing you can provide us. The more information, the better, um, especially when it comes to updates, loss history, um, rent information or rent detail. It, it, that's information, giving us good information helps us do our, the best job we can for you. And if you're evaluating a deal, you know, we always try and get you the best rate, but understanding where you underwrote it at and where it needs to be to make the deal work, that also helps us objectively make sure we're doing our, getting, meeting expectations. So I guess is um, what I was asking is, is there some sort of like checklist that you look for, like loss runs, age of building, uh, how big is the complex? Is there like a checklist you look for when you're trying to do a policy for a new operator? Yeah, absolutely. So it would be our statement of value. So it has all the building information, has square footage, um, construction type, year built, uh, list of updates for roof, electrical, plumbing, uh, heating. The, if it's an older construction, electrical is very, very important. Um, and if it's especially anything pre-1960s, the plumbing should have been updated. I mean, even 1970s, it, probably, it could be fine, but it, like to see updates. So electrical and the roof, they, they like to see a roof done within the last 20 years. So I'm, I've heard aluminum wiring is a big thing. If you were to, <laughs> Fritz is laughing because he's an electrician. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to buy an older building, say like pre 1970s, is there anything as an operator you can do during renovations to reduce your annual insurance premium once the renovations are done? Yes. If, um, okay, so for, to answer the aluminum wiring question, short answer is no. If, um, <laughs> don't buy anything unless there's something in the deal that is going to pay for the remediation, basically the pigtail to remediate that. That's an the acceptable reason, fix. The reason I laugh at that is when I was working on getting a new insurance policy, the guy was just like, do you have aluminum wiring? Because I'm going to hang up if you do. <laughs> and I, I had to double check and we, we didn't have it. So it was lucky, but <laughs> that's yeah. why I started laughing because that was the first thing he said. It's a question on every single application that, um, and stab lock breakers and, um, that was the other one. Uh, knob and tube. Yeah. Knob and knob and tubes. Are big. Yeah. Those are all no big. <laughs> they're just, they're known, they're known fault. They're known faulty to cause uh, claims. They're known to be faulty. Yeah. So, so what about plumbing too? Is there, I mean, let's assume if you're buying an older building, you're not buying it cheap enough or you can just gut it and rip out all the mechanicals. But you know, I know there are some, uh, I forget what it's called, but you can put certain things like around alum the aluminum wiring for it. You probably can know more than what can uh, shed some more light on that, but they reduce the risk of the wiring. So even if we were to do that, we wouldn't be able to lower our insurance costs at all. Well, doing that would let you get a normal insurance rate. If you have aluminum wiring that's not been remediated, you're going to be paying basically do probably double what the market value is. And that's in the, in the terms will not be favorable. Um, so what you can do uh, is some care. So if you, have you guys seen the uh, stovetop fire suppression canisters? They're basically little canisters of baking soda. Mm-hmm. So you can put those uh, in the stove hood vents and some, uh, some carriers will give you four to 7% discount on the property rate for just for having those um, requiring mandating renter's insurance uh, within the lease also will uh, give you favorable um, rating, being able to having a broker, being able to talk and discuss about your management practices will also 
help the underwriter feel good about this risk and give you a more favorable, favorable rating. Believe it or not, the underwriters, they hold a lot of the cards. So it's making, getting them very comfortable with the risk helps a lot. So, um, so for instance, like with that discussing, um, improvements on the property, like better lighting, um, it's just so better lighting for the parking lot that shows while that doesn't directly impact your insurance, um, rating, it does show that, Hey, we're a responsible operator that, has is putting safeguards in place to ensure we don't have like a slip and fall or something like that. And pigtailing was the word I couldn't think of. Yes. Pigtailing. Yes. That's the, uh, that's the, approved, that's the most widely cheapest, most accepted remediation of aluminum wiring. Just rip the shit out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask you, uh, how important is it to have the renter's insurance and make sure that your renters uh, actually apply for it? Is there a way you can kind of hold them? I mean, do you just have to present it or? So as, as best, so as we're become, we're seeing this become almost, it's probably one of the most mainstream things out there is requiring renter's insurance. Um, as far as the operator offering it, it's fine to have a pre-approved vendor. Um, it, the big thing with managing, especially as you grow, that managing renter's, insurance certificates is a administrative burden. So implementing a process to streamline that, hopefully one that integrates right into your property management software is the way to go with that. And what that protects against is typically it'll provide a hundred grant, hundred thousand dollars in liability or tenant liability. Um, so say this tenant causes a cooking fire, which is basically the most common, I think that is the most common cause of loss within the multifamily is cooking fires. Um, so that's where the, stovetop fire suppression canisters come in because the, the best loss, the cheapest loss is a loss that never happens. So mm -hmm. preventing that loss is, so that's, that's a prevention method. Um, so in terms of it, it should always be required. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of providers out there that can streamline the service for you. Um, and there's also, as you grow and become a more sophisticated client or um, operator, you can actually use the renter's insurance requirement to increase your NOI. Could you, could you dive more into that? How can you use it to increase your NOI? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, you will have the, what typically the operators will do is they'll have the requirement for renter's insurance in the lease, and then they'll have an addendum that says, hey, instead of actually buying renter's insurance, you can seed or pay us 12 to $15 a month as collected as additional rent and we'll waive this requirement. So um, what that does, and there's some, there's some provider service providers out there that you'll get a marking fee. So they'll take eight of it and the property will retain four. So that's per door. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's basically how it does. And it's collected as extra rent, additional rent. So you seed eight of it to whatever provider is doing that to, or doing this for you. And if there's a claim, you know, a covered claim for tenant liability, they'll pay out up, typically up to whatever the deductible is of the property. Are you struggling to understand how to underwrite multifamily properties? Hi, I'm John Stober and I completely understand your problem. I thought underwriting would come naturally to me due to my background in finance and accounting but I quickly found out that there aren't a lot of resources that cover this subject. I had no idea whether what I was doing was right, wrong, or just original. I don't want you to have to pick up little nuggets here and there like I did. So I wrote an ebook called How to Analyze Big Apartment Buildings and Make Them Feel Small that puts together all the pieces of the puzzle. We're also giving away a deal analyzer with the ebook, and they're both completely free. Don't wait as long as I did to start chasing financial freedom. Go to bit.ly forward slash underwriting ebook and get your free copy today. So speaking of NOI, when we're negotiating with a seller or with a broker and we're looking at their insurance line item, are there any ways you can kind of figure out if they're overpaying for their insurance other than just knowing your market really well? Like what are some questions you could ask the seller about their insurance policy? Just ask for the whole policy. <laughs> um, I mean, you're likely under some sort of, sort of privacy agreement anyway. So it, it should be, we've actually been telling our 
uh, commercial brokers to include that in their um, um, what's it called the uh, uh, offering offer memorandum. Yeah, they should have that. So they'll put the pro forma in there. And if honestly, if you see anything below two fifty a unit on a uh, pro forma, there it's either actual cash value or a or not valued correctly, we're talking like 80 bucks a square foot versus 125, or it's just not a good policy. So I would always ask, request for the, ask for the whole policy so you can see it. Um, know what the market, know what the market rate is, especially in the area, know the trends. So I mean, like I said, anything below 250, anything below 230, I would really question. Mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of sellers changing their policy as they get ready to sell maybe to boost NOI? I haven't seen that. Um, but I've seen every single OM that I've seen the insurance is projected way under where it should be. Yeah. I just wonder cause uh, you see some sellers maybe defer maintenance and stuff to boost NOI. And I wonder yeah. if that's a tactic maybe they use to get that number higher. I don't know if they've gotten there yet. Um, <laughs> well, hopefully nobody listens to this and goes and does it. <laughs> right, right. I say that's a that's a really good question. I, it, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're the buyer, all the, to make the pro forma. I mean, you're just looking at it at face value to make that say make the numbers work with the lender. It's really going to be what your broker can deliver. So good conservative underwriting. I'm telling people right now, three hundred a unit just. Depending, again, depending on factors, but conservatively 300 a unit uh, to be on the safe side. I feel like if you're in a market like Florida or Texas, it's like double that. It, correct. It's going to be, a, it's going to be different. I, mean, I guess I'm speaking more of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're in a, we'll call them a high cat state um, or high cat zone, um, you know, Florida, anything coastal, uh, Texas, you get a lot of hail. And if you're near the coast, you get hurricanes and flooding that can come in. And tornadoes. Yeah, California is California. So it's, um, it's, it's about knowing the market. And, and, um, I, and being able to benchmark and just understand what, what the cost is in the area. So earlier you mentioned that, I mean, you have some basic coverages in every policy that your lender is going to require. What are coverages that you see a lot of operators not putting into their policies and you just like shaking your head because you're like, you, like how are you not going to put that into your insurance? You know, I, I think the most common ones that would get, if you don't have a broker that knows what they're doing is missing ordinance and law and sewer and water backup. Those two just, they, they should be an automatically included on every commercial real estate policy. Um, the other one I'd say, just make sure you have, your valuations are correct. And then if you're in excess and surplus lines, there are these things they call safeguards. And if you don't adhere to the safeguards, then they could deny, potentially deny a claim. So one of the new ones that's been popping up is uh, if there's a fire, so um, one of the safeguards is no grills on decks or patios, or it has to be a certain amount of feet away. If a fire, if a fire was started by a grill and they had those safeguards on there, uh, the carrier could potentially deny that property claim. And the benefit of having a broker that understands, hey, these safeguards are BS, they can push back on the carrier to get them removed. Mm -hmm. So it's not even it's not just about negotiating the best rate; it's also about the terms and conditions as well. So what about income loss from like a natural disaster? So we're not going to talk about COVID because the whole world is still figuring out what, uh, how, how everything's going to react to that. But um, so business income, typically we see 12 months of actual loss sustained. So what they would do is they'd look at your rent roll for the trailing 12 or something. And if, you know, so you've say you've got a whole building that goes down, they would replace the actual loss of rents associated with that because you need that, income to make the note payment or the uh, mortgage payment. And uh, then they'll typically have either 180 day, a uh, or three or six month extension on that in case there were construction delays or something like that. And some, or sometimes you can do a standard 18 month uh, business income uh, coverage as well. So are they just paying you for the, 
for um, the note payment or, or I mean, they paying you for the entire rent roll. Cause if your building burns down, you're not going to be paying your landscaper or any repairs and maintenance. Like I, you might actually make money on that policy. Correct. Yeah. You, uh, you, it's, it's a, well, no, it's a, it's actual loss of state. So they would look at the, uh, they look at the rent roll. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, well, okay, yeah, that, don't get, don't get any crazy ideas. Right. No, I mean, that's why it's important to make sure that your rents are up, are correct on your statement of values. So not only is the building valuation, but your rent, um, your rent rolls are accurate. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that I actually went through, I wanted to know what causes a company to drop a client. So, um, and how can you avoid it as an operator? So there's a couple things that can cause a carrier to either non-renew, um, side their canceling coverage with 30 day notice, or just get off the risk altogether. So the broadest one, which we've seen, and we're actually expecting more of to see soon, is uh, they're pulling out of the market altogether. They're non-renewing that type of risk. So recently, uh, Philadelphia, I think um, starting in the Q4 of 19, they started non-renewing all of their market rate habitational risk. So us knowing that, I mean, that's, we're, we know that ahead of all of their, the, uh, the uh, operators insured of Philadelphia because they get, because they'll give them a 30 day notice. That's, that's it. 30 days before the renewal. Um, and they just pulled out of the market because they were getting their uh, butt kicked with losses. So that's one reason. Um, if there's been a, uh, if there's been a catastrophic, so uh, we've got a, we'll say it's like a 40 unit apartment building. It's insured for 20 grand a year. They have a, or, you know, there's two buildings there. They have a building that goes down the replacement cost, and that's $1.2 million. The carrier will never get their money back on that policy. So at 20 grand a year, up to 1.2 million, they're, they're never going to get that back. So they might not renew that risk because they want it off their books. Um, the other thing that could happen is just a, it could be a high frequency of claims, but not high payouts. It, it's, they might, but that, there would have to be a lot of other factors in that. And then the, really the last one is if every time you, for the most part, most carriers will do a loss control visit with, uh, they'll have a, uh, a third party inspector go out and uh, visit the site and submit their loss control recommendations. And that's, so that would be like making sure the exit signs are lit. Well, the uh, common areas are well lit. Um, the fire doors close. Uh, you've got smoke detectors in place. So this is stuff, that's what, what they look for. Uh, and if you, if there were critical safety issues that were not uh, addressed in a uh, timely manner and they're reasonable, uh, then they could issue a notice of uh, cancellation. So what I also want to know is how does scalability and growing your portfolio impact your insurance? Like if I have a hundred units is my per a hundred units in the same market is my per door cost going to be higher than if I had a thousand units in that market? So I would say 120 to 150 units on up is kind of the sweet spot. Um, so that's when you really start to leverage economies of scale and you can actually drive the cost down. Um, it's all, it's all relative. So in the past, so over the past 10 years, the, we've been in a soft market. So that means each quarter, each year, the rates of property rates have gone down for good risks. Um, July of last year, the, the market turned hard. So that means property rates are going up and not just a little bit. And, what's driving that is there's been a lot of catastrophic losses globally just where we're having worse storms more storms and then a higher frequency of claims more cooking fires all the whole gamut um so after going down for 10 years now it's kind of spiked up so what we're seeing there is with uh, the property rates right now are typically we're seeing eight to fifteen percent on a good risk no uh no, you know low claims or no claims uh and then a, an account with claims on it, we're seeing typically 20 to all the way up to hundred percent increase depending on how bad their claims were. Wait, so like hundred percent is in their insurance policy or the, the premium doubles. Yeah. So we had a granted this client, they beat the, they beat the market five years in a row and each year they've had 
over a 100% loss ratio. Um, they've got 13,000 units across, uh, I think they're in 18 states. Um, so they went from paying, uh, I think they were paying rate right about 1.5, 1.6 to uh, 3.4. That was what the renewal came in at. Holy crap. But each year, the past five years, they've had losses that were rated right about 1.5 to 1.8 due to it just nothing of their own. A lot of it was bad luck, hail, or uh, lightning strikes. That'll hurt the NOI. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, well, it was, it was offset. So what they actually ended up doing is uh, they were, uh, they self-funded the first 2 million. So it was money that was going to be spent anyway. And then mm-hmm. the carrier that they were with is ensuring any claims above that. So what I also like to know is what is a co-insurance? I found a definition online and says it means your, your policy means you have enough coverage to be within the required limit replacement amounts from your carrier. Many policies have a co- have a high co-insurance limit up to 100% of the full replacement costs. So we what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So think about that. Is it's, it's cost sharing. It's your deductible kind of. Um, so are you guys familiar with like your medical insurance? Mm-hmm. So you've got a, you've either got a copay, think about that, that's your deductible. Or if it's a, say everything's been met, um, you'll have either have like a 30% you pay the carrier will pay 70% or it's 80, 20 or 90, 10 or something like that. So it's just like that. Um, we don't present anything with the coinsurance. It's always replacement costs hundred percent, no coinsurance penalty or anything like that. You'll see current coinsurance used on to, I guess, lower value. So if it's not valued correctly, then there would be some cost sharing there. So like 80 bucks a square foot likely has a 80, 20 coinsurance. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's cost sharing. That's all it is. It's so you have some skin in the game. It's, it's like if you're, you know, your car gets an offender bender and you've got a $500 deductible, that's your, that's your cost share. All right, Rama. Well, I wanted to get over to our section that we call our fast five. They're the same five questions we ask every guest who comes on our show. So if you're ready, we'll get right into it. Yeah, absolutely. So if you had to start all over again and you were in your early 20s, how would you do that? So the short answer is I would have gotten started sooner. A uh, little bit about my background. My, uh, so I pursued, so through high school, I was focused on just getting into college and I was for sure I was going to be a doctor. And then in college, all I did was take science classes and do research and work in a hospital. And I had the blinders on. Uh, so you, with an Indian parent, your options are either either a doctor, lawyer, or engineer. So here I am, the black sheep. So that's, if I would have changed anything, it would have been and gone back and explored the world of what else is out there. Because I had no idea until my mid-20s that, you know, this the whole world of business out there was a lot more to this world than just science and medicine. So I would have gone back and actually gotten a business degree. Um, and then just got it, just got started earlier. Um, Mm -hmm. I found switching from when I decided not to go after pursue medicine anymore, I, uh, found my biggest challenge was I was highly unmarketable on paper, uh, applying for anything outside of, the hospital experience I had or research or academia, which I really didn't have any interest in anymore. So it was a, uh, so I, I, I got lucky, but that, that's what I would do differently. Okay. I think a lot of people can relate to that. <laughs> uh, next question. So normally we ask, how do you see young professionals adding the most value to experience operations in this space? But how do you see young professionals in your field adding the mo- helping people with more experience in this space? Like, how do you see yourself helping experienced operators? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just as a side tangent, I, out of all the events I've been to in the last 18 months where we've got a, you know, a large operator, typically, you know, 2000 all the way up to, 60,000 units, they've all said their most valuable asset is their people. And they all say their biggest challenge is recruiting talent. Um, you know, it's been a hot job market, but I mean, that's, they, 
these are all, these are the thought leaders in the space saying that, hey, our people are our best asset. Um, so for, with, especially with young professionals, what do we have a lot of? We have time, we have energy, we have a desire to learn, and we all crave mentorship and guidance. So what, a lot of what you'll get is, so especially a younger person in the insurance field, you'll get attention to detail, you'll get the concierge service you want, um, while knowing that they are not yet an expert, but understanding that they can get the information that you require if needed, and they've got a good bench, hopefully, behind them. So what's the biggest mistake you've made in your career, and how have you since adjusted your business? I think that if I had to pin it on something, the biggest mistake would be not getting started sooner. Um, I think anything that could be categorized as a mistake, uh, I, if you, it's not a mistake if you turn, in my opinion, it's not a mistake if you use it as a learning experience and yeah, yeah it, it, if it becomes part of you and moving forward and Hey, all right, this is what I learned when I, effed up in this situation if it doesn't happen again then it's a learning experience if it happens again then it's definitely a mistake and shame on you for not learning from it so i think being able to take each learning experience along the way and embody it as it becomes part of your story um i think that's the best thing you can do to position yourself after a um, quote-unquote mistake I like that it's been your favorite way to incorporate technology and social media into your business well it's been so when I was in college, I didn't think a brand was an actual thing. I was like, what, why are people talking about personal brand? That sounds dumb. And, you know, it makes sense, you know, when you're in the science world, and you're, what the hell's a personal brand? Um, most of my, it, it, this is definitely a challenging question for me. It was challenging for me to figure out, um, but I've got a great answer for it. I, I use LinkedIn and I had to think, where do my decision makers, wh what platform are they on? LinkedIn is the best choice even though that's still not a majority of them because a lot of the decision makers are you know in their mid 40s on up and technology is not exactly so it depends how engaged they are within whatever their community uh professional community is so what i've used i use linkedin to really it, it, to manage my personal brand um and that's to share insights best practices um showcase community engagement um and it's kind of like, it's a, it's as a business consultant with, an ex, with a specialization in risk management and insurance. Because I know a lot about just general business operations, but this is what I'm really good at. Awesome. Got to go where, where they're hanging out online. Yeah. And then, so last question is, what book or books have most influenced you on your journey? So I'm, I've always been a big proponent of self-development and investing in yourself. Um, and thankfully, I've got a company that stands behind that and, and uh, invests in me. Um, in terms of books, uh, Jeb Blunt, and he has, uh, he has a number of books out, but two that I've really resonated, have really resonated with me have been Fanatical Prospecting and Sales EQ. And it's what really, what the big takeaways from that is, Make sure you're leading with value, adding value, uh, being able to understand, and then being able to understand what's important to everyone in the room or sitting across the table from you. And when you're leading, leading with value, being a resource, being a partner, um, and then you truly understand what their qualms are, what their challenges are, it makes it, take, it really takes the sales word out of everything. When it makes business sense, it's an easy decision. So I try and position myself where it makes, where it's an easy decision for a decision maker to make. Awesome. Yeah. And I can definitely uh, attend to that because you, you helped me out with my policy and you led with, uh, you know, some of these carriers might even make me money, but I, I want to get it done for you. And for me, I was just like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure you make money just because you said that, <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, it would, it, thankfully I don't come from a place of need. Um, the company pays, a healthy salary to um, I guess the salespeople starting out so it's not and we're not on a draw or anything like that I, in fact I don't know any other insurance broker in the U.S. that pays um, the way we do in terms of when if after you're already 
you know, established and everything. It's they, they have the best payment schedule or uh, setup, but they also really understand that it really takes three to five years to uh, actually start getting some traction in this industry because the business owner is not going to trust you if you've got, Hey, I'm starting to start in the insurance industry. Please trust your whole business with me. You've really got to build your brand reputation and just experience. And a seasoned decision maker can sit across the table and they can tell if you're BSing them. So you've really got to have a good brand, actually be intelligent and uh, add value. That's, that's really what it is there. Mm -hmm. So Rama, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of the millennials and multifamily podcast. What would be the best way for our listeners to reach out to you if they have any insurance needs or questions? Everyone can find me on LinkedIn. It's just Rama Gupta Kapnik and then LinkedIn. Just plug that in Google, I'll pop up. Or it's my first name, period, last name at Kapnik.com. Or shoot, I mean, I since everyone has it anyway, you can even text me at my, on my cell number. <laughs> and how do you spell Kapnik? It's K-A-P-N-I-C-K. K-A-P-N-I-C-K. All righty. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening to the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast, brought to you by Kronos Investment Partners. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and a written review at iTunes so that we can connect with more people. Finally, head on over to kronosinvestmentpartners.com and sign up for our newsletter so you can stay updated on everything we're doing. If you're interested in partnering with us as we find new opportunities, you can also schedule a phone call with us under the Contact Us tab at kronosinvestmentpartners.com.